Thank you very much, Reza. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, really thanks all of you for coming so early. And uh, you provided a marvelous context uh, for everything. I think it's uh, just very hard to live to those expectations. Impossible. So today I am going to tell you a little bit about the work we've done uh, at uh, Rice Lab at Berkeley. The Rice Lab is a lab we created at Berkeley which follows AMLAB with some of these uh, softwares, open source softwares uh, that uh, Reza mentioned about, like Spark, has been developed. And in particular, I'm going to talk about our reinforcement learning systems effort. Um, so let me dive in. Um, you know, if you look around, if you look up over the past uh, decade or so, fundamentally there are two major trends which really shaped many, already shaped many industries big data and AI. Today, basically every organization collects more and more data, and they collect this data with one goal in mind, get some value out of it. And this typically means um, getting some insights in the data, but more importantly, making some decisions based on the data. That's how you hear more and more that data is only as valuable as the decision it enables. And more and more of these decisions are done by AI, right, or machine learning. If you talk about movie recommendation engines, uh, healthcare, fraud detection, and financial, uh, uh, financial decisions, manufacturing, self-driving cars, and main drones, and so, mu so much more. However, to really fulfill the potentials of these intelligent decisions, um, we need to build systems that can power not only make decisions, but can power these mission critical applications, uh, which are deployed in ad adversarial and continuous, continuously changing environment. Okay? Um, and those, you know, the RISE Lab goal is to develop open source platforms, tools, and algorithms for real time intelligent decisions on live data, decisions which, which are also secure and explainable. Okay, so this is what RISE stands for. Real time, intelligent, secure, and explainable decisions. And to do so, we are taking a holistic approach combining AI, security systems, and architectures. And to just give you a sense of why we believe this approach is needed, just think about an example in which you have a robot doing you know, manufacturing or manipulate, doing some other kind of manipulations. So, in order to develop these applications, you might leverage reinforcement learning and control hierarchies to learn better models and make faster decisions. Also, um, you need to make sure that, you know, you may want actually to learn faster, to share the information across multiple robots to improve the model faster. Uh, however, in order to enable that, you know, not only need to build these distributed algorithms, but you need to make sure that the robot is, um, and these learning algorithms are robust in the presence of adversarial learning, um, for instance, and many other security attacks. For this, we need also to build systems which bridge and span the edge and the cloud. And finally, you know, you need to take advantage of all of these kind of uh, new uh, AI accelerators or for security hardware enclaves. And maybe, who knows, uh, try to figure out nuance. So in this particular talk, I am going to focus, like I mentioned, from all of these topics on reinforcement learning. Okay? So, as you know, everyone now here knows, in a nutshell, with reinforcement learning, you have an agent continually learning by interacting with an environment. An environment can be the world around us, can be a game, many others. And the way the robot is interacting is by making actions, and an action changes the state of the environment, and the agent observes this state, the, change, uh, the, state in, the change in the state, and also you may get a reward, and based on that, it's going to learn and tune the, this policy, which the policy fundamentally is a mapping between the current state of the environment 
and an action to making the state. And you know, examples of the state is a, you know, where the pieces are placed on a board game. In that case, the action is a moving a piece, reward is winning or losing the game. Um, so you know many, many of the such examples. And you know, it's becoming quite popular in Forceman Learning these days, the reason, one of the reasons we are focusing on it. However, if you look at this reinforcement learning uh, applications, they have pretty hard requirements. So first on, it's a nested parallelism. So what do I mean by that? So if you think about, you develop this kind of policies or models, they have hyperparameters. Hyper so for instance, you want, at, at, at the highest levels, you want to take and to tune these hyperparameters, higher parameter search, right? Now, tuning the higher parameters requires to, to, uh, to run and learn multiple policies with the particular parameters. So one of these kind of green, green boxes in this, uh, uh, in, in, on the left-hand side, it's expanding in this um, learning a model, uh, learning a policy in RL, right? And learning a policy, in turn, consists of doing some rollouts. You have a policy, right? And then you kind of evaluate that policy, you get the reward, and you take all these rewards and the previous policy and do this kind of AGD to update the policy, right? You update the policies and you do more rollouts, update the policy, more rollouts, right? That AGD box is just stochastic gradient descent to update the policy, right? And the way, at the bottom level, you know, like the way you, uh, you do a rollout is basically interacting with the environment, with the simulator, right? You look at the state or the obs you observe the environment, you make another action. So that particular step of making the action actually in many cases also happens in parallel because you may want to take multiple actions in parallel from rollouts which happens in parallel in order to reduce the training time, okay? Um, another requirement is um, heterogeneity. So different of these tasks have different durations. At the top level, in the high parameter search, if you have some parameters after a while, they are not very promising, don't give you the, good, the, the best results, you are going to stop that kind of branch from further exploration. In the case of doing rollouts, again, rollouts is interacting with the environment. If you think of a game, say a game of chess, you know, the, you, can win a, you can lose a game in three moves or it takes you 40 moves to win the game. So it's very different lengths. The rollouts can have different lengths. Um, and you also, there you have heterogeneity in terms of resources, right? For some rollouts, you use only CPUs. If you do the HGD, you use GPUs and many others, okay? And finally, you want ideally to, to uh, have support for real time because if you build a policy and you want to render actions, for instance, for uh, robotics or even uh, self-driving applications, then you need to render these actions in real time, okay? So to address these requirements, we have been building for the past more than one year a new system at Berkeley called Ray. It's a system for distributed AI. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this system. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about some application of RL, some of them using these systems. Okay, so that's my rest of the talk. So Ray is, it's, uh, has a very flexible architecture. Um, and actually, it's providing a dynamic task graph uh, ab abstraction layer. And on top of each, it provides two abstractions parallel task and actors. I'm going to tell a little bit about it, uh, talk about uh, each of them in turn in the next few slides. Um, Ray provides a binding in Python, so you can develop in Python. This is a lingua franca for machine learning uh, uh, researchers and engineers. And uh, the back end, like you, uh, I'm going to tell you, is in C, C++, so it's highly scalable and uh, high performance. So it's a very simple Python program. How many of you use Python? Okay, perfect. So it's a very simple one, you know. You have a, a function which reads a NumPy array from a, from a file, and then you have another function which adds such two arrays, 
and then uh, you know this is a code, right? You read uh, two um, arrays and you sum them up. So now, if I want to uh, parallelize this program with Ray, it's quite simple. So basically, you add these decorators, Ray dot remote, for each of these functions, for the uh, reading from the from the files, and then for the addition. And this means that these functions under the hood are going to be distributed and can run in parallel on different nodes in the system. Um, also, if you want to, real, to, to run this function remotely, when you invoke the functions, you also add remote a modifier in front, you know, in front of the arguments. And the one thing here, you see a new function here, ray get. So why is that is because the abstraction it provides, ray provides is a future abstraction, right? So basically this means that when you call a function, you get the identifier of the return, you don't get the object itself, and you don't need to wait to, for, the, for the object. Why is that? Because this increases parallelism, right? I run, I, I start a function, I can start the next one without waiting for the result for the previous one, right? And when you get, when you want to get the results, you, you call ray.get. So what happens, uh, you know, under the hood is something like that, okay? So you say you have two nodes, uh, and each of them stores file one and file two, respectively. Uh, when you call read array for the, from the file one, the remote file one, we spawn a task on that uh, node to read the file one uh, and returns immediately identifier one. Remember, this is a future abstraction. And then you go immediately and, and start the second to read file two from the second node, returns ID two, and then you, you going to get these two identifiers, which are the futures, and you are going to pass in the add function, which is going to return you the final ID, and now you've won the final result, and you are going to call ray get, right? So up to ray get, nothing really happens. You just scheduled all these tasks. Now with ray get, you are going to block, and you are going to wait for all this task graph to be executed and return the results, produce the results. Make sense? It's quite simple. Now, it turns out that this is a very flexible uh, abstraction. However, it's not enough. And this was a lesson we learned after a few months. And why is that? Um, there are several reasons. So this, this, uh, this um, function, the remote functions, the way I presented them, they are stateless. In the sense they don't have internal state. You know, they read the data, they do the computation, they write the data, they are gone. But this is actually not enough. And we, we kind of, one of the, one of the reasons is, is um, you know, in many cases, for instance, when you want to do, at least there are cases, in which you, you want to do, uh, when you do simulations, you use a, a game or a, a simulator. Now, if you do not have the code of that simulator, it's not open source, there is no way to get out the state. Remember, in order to do one of these rollouts, what do I need to do, okay? If I, if I use task, then each task will be taking an action. So for each task, I need to present the state, get the action, and get, uh, get the reward. I, I have the task, I feed the task, uh, sorry, I have the state, I feed the state to the simulator, then, I'm, I, then I send the action to the simulator, then the simulator should return me the state and the reward, so now I have the state for the next step. However, from a closed source simulator, there is no way I can get the state. So the only thing I can see in this case, for instance, is the image, right? Like in these Atari games, so you see the image, right? So that's your proxy for the state, right? So now you see, so now you are going to make the action based on the observation. So you are going basically now to see the image. I'm going for on that observation of the, of, of the game, take the next action. Right? But now that simulator is stateful, right? I cannot divide it in small tasks where each task is about taking one action. So that's one example in which basically you need more stateful constructs. Another example is that some state is just expensive to create, 
So if you are talking about the GPUs and uh, you want to do multiple operations on the GPUs, you don't want to reinstate and reinitialize the state every time. Okay. So to make the long story short, so we introduce this new abstract, which is actors. It's again in parallel languages and parallel systems, uh, parallel task computation and actor-based computations are two classic uh, uh, models. I think the unique thing here is that typically you have parallel task and actor systems. Here we have a system which provides both. Anyhow, so the way we, 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 we do that is very simple. Again, you have a class now, and we make a class remote. The class has internal state, so this is our actor. And here how we call it, so this class is just a counter. You are going to increment every time you are going to call inc. It's going to increment the internal variable value. So here obviously if you are going to increment it three times, you are going to get, and each time you are going to get an, an identifier. So the result is again a future. Then if you do ray get on all the identifiers you get after each increment, you are going to get the results one to three. Make sense? Okay. So now, let me tell you how you can use this simple uh, API and to implement evolution strategy. So actually, evolution strategy was presented here last year, and it's actually becoming a quite popular reinforcement learning algorithm due to its simplicity and good results. And basically what this is about, as a high level, you try a, a lots of different policies and see which works best. I am oversimplifying here, but this is just a general idea. And here it's a very simplified code. So first, this is a Python code. And first you are defining a worker, which is performing the simulations. The simulations take as an input a policy and a seed, and they are going to return the reward. Now you are going to instantiate and create, say, a bunch of workers, in this case 20, and then you are going to start uh, learning the policy, you are going to generate some seed, and you are going in parallel to run multiple policies, 20 policies, you are going to get the rewards, and you are going to update the policy, right? And you are going to do all of this 200 times, random numbers. So how? If I use Ray, how do I parallelize this? Very simple, we know by then, you are going to put the Ray remote the corrector in front of, you know, for the, for the declaration of the worker class. So this means that this class can be instantiated and run on a remote node. In order to run it on the remote node, you are going to, when you create the worker, class, worker, worker instance, you have to also append the remote and when you do the simulations, when you invoke the method of that uh, class, you also are going to add a remote, and in the end, you want to get all the rewards, right, and to update the policy. So that's pretty much it. You do this, and your, this will get parallelized, and you can run it on many, many, many cores, okay? So next, let me tell you a little bit about the architectures of Ray. So it's, um, it has a classic architecture at this, at this level. It has a driver in which you run the main programs and a bunch of workers which runs this kind of task and other and, uh, actors. Um, all the, um, these workers or drivers which are on the same node for efficiency reasons, they exchange the information through shared memory. The shared memory, um, it's uh, implemented the data structures using Apache Arrow. It's an open source system, quite popular these days. Used to exchange the data between um, big different various big data frameworks. Um, for each node, we have a local scheduler. So if, say, the driver uh, wants to launch a task, the local scheduler we launch it locally as long as there are enough resources and the data is local. If the input data for the task is remote and there is no longer capacity on the local node, the task is forwarded to a global scheduler. Furthermore, we have an architecture in which we take 
uh, all the state, all the control state, which is object table, task tables, uh, the functions, the event logs, uh, logs, and you put in this global control store. The, the nice thing about this is that now all the system becomes stateless. And the advantage of be, being, being stateless is that if any of the nodes fails or global scheduler fails, you just bring up a new instance and it goes to the global store and gets the most up-to-date up state, right? So, and at the same time, because you have in this global control store all this information, you are going, it's very easy to build different uh, um, debugging tools and profiling tools because you just go into this state in this global control store. You don't need to go to every, every kind of component in the system, grab the state, put it together, to debug or to profile, okay? So this system is highly scalable. Um, again, a global control, uh, global control uh, store. To scale it, we shard it. Um, the identifiers, it's easy to shard because the identifiers for the objects, task, and the functions are pseudo-random. So it's easy to, again, to shard. Uh, the scheduler is distributed. Right, so it's not really a bottleneck. And um, one other thing is that tasks can spawn other tasks. This is one, one, uh, one, uh, one important issue. This is important for two reasons. One, this provides you this ability to implement these nested computations and nested parallelism, where a task runs a bunch of other parallel tasks. Right, that's one reason. The other reason it eliminates, even if you, uh, even if you uh, make the scheduler highly scalable. So everything is highly scalable. You still have a driver and not to have the ability to, for a task to run other tasks. The driver itself becomes a bottleneck in how many tasks you can submit for execution, right? So that's uh, quite important. So let me, uh, performance is quite good. So for instance, on 15 hours, we can get to execute 1 million tasks per second. The latency of local task execution is around, uh, so when a task is executed on the local node, uh, no op task doesn't do anything, but it's just overhead, it's 300 microseconds. The latency for remote task execution is one millisecond, and actually we, we are working on a new version which will reduce probably that number to half. Is fault tolerance. The fault tolerance actually turns out is very important also in training and so forth, because you do not want something is, is for many reasons, right? At scale, as you know, and you heard for many years now, is a, if you have a big clusters, then the failure of a node becomes common case and the, rather than a rare case. Also, for other reasons, it's important. Like for instance, if you run it in the cloud, AWS, if I use the spot instances, I may kind of lose these instances. I may be preempted. The spot instances are the cheap one, can be 10x cheaper than the regular instances. So you want to be protected against these failures to not lose the computation. And um, uh, Ray provides this ability, it's fault tolerant. This is an example. The time is on the uh, uh, x axis, on the y axis, you have two y axis. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not the most readable plot. But on the left hand side, you have the throughput in the task per second. On the right-hand side, you have the number of nodes. So it varies the number of nodes which is available to the computation. We start, we start with 50 nodes, and at time 50, the number of nodes drops to, I believe, 30, if I see correctly. And then at time 100, 100 seconds, it drops to 10. And then after a time a little bit over 200 seconds, it grows back to 50, right? So ideally, this is what you want to see. You want to see this kind of the, the task, the, the task throughput will be, be, should be proportional with the number of nodes which you are in the system. And as you can see with Ray, this is happening. So the number of tasks which are executed are uh, following this curve with this uh, line, which is the availability, the dotted line, which is the availability of the, no the number of nodes which is available, right? Now, the red, with red, you have the new task being executed, right? And then you have, you see, you have some gaps there, right? And you have also some blue, a little bit of the blue uh, area. The blue area, which are the tasks which are being, reconstructing the lost objects. So when the node fails, you lose the objects. 
if this object are used as inputs by another task, you need to reconstruct them, right? So that's the overhead, the blue uh, area. Okay? So this is what I said. Okay. And this is the object reconstruction. Okay, so soon let me just wrap up my presentation of Ray and go to the application. So we already built a few useful libraries on top of Ray. One is called RLlib, which, uh, you know, it's obvious what it is. It's a scalable and composable reinforcement learning li library, and Raytune is a flexible high-parameter high search library. So RLlib, um, it's, it's again, it's like provide support via Ray for nested parallelism, which I, which I mentioned is very important for the end-to-end -end RL applications. You can easily compost, compose different reinforcement learning algorithms. This is AlphaGo, which is developed on top of RLib. And obviously, it has uh, easy integration, which is broadly used re, uh, d deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Okay, so I'm not going to say much more than this. Um, you know, we'll, uh, I invite you to go to the Ray GitHub page and you get all the information documentation there. Uh, but let me just uh, say a little bit about performance. These are performance for two applications. This is um, uh, evolution strategy, um, which I shown you earlier. This is RLE versus a specialized um, parallel uh, implementation, right? So Redis based is a, it's a specialized implementation for exact for this algorithm. And RLib, it's you can see the number, the mean time to solve the problem, to train a policy, versus the number of CPUs. And as you can see, the lower the better. And uh, Ray, yes, it's this blue. So you know, the TLDR here, it performs better. It's much easier to develop because it's on top of RLib. Um, and uh, it also scales beyond the size of the cluster on which this specialized system uh, for uh, it's, it's scaling for, uh, yes, evolution strategy. And on the right-hand side is another algorithm, uh, proximity policy, uh, proximal policy optimization. Um, it's again, this is an open AI versus an open AI implementation, specialized implementation for that particular algorithm. Again, Ray performs quite well. And it's again, the main point here, it's, it's about, it provides this kind of general uh, library. And it's, the main gain is that it's much, much easier to implement these algorithms. And Raytune is high, high parameter search, right? You know, all of this, you know, it's here where you spend all your money, right? It's like you kind of develop the model, the policies, now, oops, you know, I have these high parameters, right? It's like how many layers, you know, activation functions, so, so forth, right? And now you try all of these hyperparameters and you, it's very expensive. Um, so, you know, we try to make that easy and efficient. So we support uh, with Raytheon a bunch of uh, scheduler, Grease, grease search, this is a favorite of many people. Simple to use and simple to understand, but we also implement some of the most modern one, which hopefully is go they are going to reduce the resource requirements to perform hyperparameter search. It's more intelligent search in the space of hyperparameters, like hyperband, Bayesian optimization, and population-based uh, population training, a paper which was recently uh, published by um, DeepMind from Google. And also has some rich visualization, including RLab vSkit is supporting it. RLab is a very popular, it's a popular reinforcement learning library for one node, which runs on one node. And Google Vizier's uh, parallel uh, coordinate, coordinate, coordinates visualization. So Google Vizier is an internal Google high parameter search tool. Okay. So this is about the systems we built for scalable RL, okay? So now let me switch gears, and in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about some um, applications, uh, uh, RL applications, 
okay? And many of these applications are not done only by our lab, but in collaboration with other labs. I'm going to mention that. And in particular, I'm going to look at three applications. One is mixed autonomy traffic. The second one is SQL query optimization. The third one, actually, there are two applications there, but it's one theme, control hierarchies and program synthesis and robotics manipulation. So it's pretty wide. Mixed autonomic traffic. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of, it's, it's, a, it's a fun project. Um, so this is actually done, and we are just helping uh, by path from uh, uh, IOR department from Berkeley. And here it's the problem they try to solve. So obviously everyone now here, it's about this congestion. It's a big headache, right? There are many, many studies and many, many numbers. I picked only two of them here. It's one of one says that commuters waste a full week in traffic each year. Another one says that highway, highway accounts for 75% of transportation energy usage. So of anything you can do better here, it will be a significant improvement for in the lives of many, many people, many of us being in this room. And of course, it's one, one, uh, one uh, solution will be, well, you know, when we are going to have all the cars will be kind of self-driving, they are going to be smart and they are going to optimize uh, the traffic flow, you know, minimize the congestion and all these marvelous things. However, that will happen, and I guess, when it, but it will take some time, right? It's like, I don't know. When now will be all the cars on our streets uh, self-driving, you know, 20 years, I don't know, right? It's, it will be a, a long process. So the question here is, a, is very simple. Can you do anything? Or what you can do, how can you impact the traffic dynamics, hopefully in a good way, right, when only a fraction of the cars are autonomous? Okay. And to illustrate the problem, let me show you this kind of video. Sorry for the resolution, we didn't do this video, but it's a famous example. And basically saying to tell you how humans are behaving, right, it's just an example, even in the simple scenarios. Right? And of course, the behavior is not necessarily optimal. So here is, a, here is an experiment. It's in Japan, was done in Japan. You have a ring, a road, a ring, right? 230 meters. You have 22 cars driven by humans. And they are told, drive at 30 kilometers per hour, constant speed. Just go into, it's a simplest, one of the simplest kind of scenarios of driving, right? Don't take left and right, just drive in a circle at 30 miles per hour, okay? So what do you think it happens? Okay, so they are starting. Okay. So what it happens, you know, there are kind of gaps being created, and what, when you see a gap, what do you do? You accelerate to close to the guy in front of you. But when you get there, you are going to break, right? And, you know, look, like the standstill. So then instead of doing constant speed 30 kilometers per hour, it's kind of stop and go traffic. Okay? So you get, even in this simple example, with this simple instruction, you get traffic jam. Okay? So why is this, uh, or how you can formulate this uh, as a reinforcement learning? Uh, problem, simple. The state is car position. The action, acceleration, braking, maybe lane change. The policy, we use in this, in this case, they are using, you know, uh, uh, trusted region, policy optimization, TRPO, three hidden layers. This is a policy, it's a neural network with three hidden layers. Um, and the reward is the average velocity. I want to, in, to maximize the average velocity. So you do that in the simulator, and there are quite a few simulators available. And from all these cars, right on the question, you know, from all these cars, I have only one, with the yellow car, which is autonomous. All the cars are driven by humans. Now, to start with, so you see that yellow. To start with, all the cars, including the yellow one, are kind of simulate, human simulated, so there is no autonomous car. We just try to um, reproduce 
the, what, we, what you saw before. Okay? And sure enough, you see the same behavior, right? Stop and go, right? And at some point in this now, it's a little bit, uh, it will be, we switch, and now the, the yellow will be controlled, so it will be autonomous ve uh, out, an, an autonomous vehicle. So what you can see now, what is going to yellow car to do, instead of when he sees a gap to accelerate as fast as, you know, to get as fast as possible as a back to the other car, it's going to maintain the distance and it tries to match its, its speed with the car in front of it, right? And, you know, it's working pretty well. So you may say, you know, Jon, this is pretty easy, right? I can, you, you can do it, right? Well, it turns out, and by the way, this provides you forty, fifty percent speed increase in this case. So again, you may say it's like, this is, you know, it's like, you, why do you need RL for this, right? It's pretty classic control, right? Um, well, it turns out, which again, these are not my results, are people from IOR results. Um, and this is a pretty complicated graph, but don't worry that we are going to look at only two lines. Okay, but anyways, on the x-axis is the vehicle density, right? How many vehicles you have, say, in the that ring? On the y-axis is average speed. So obviously, the higher the density, the smaller the speed you are going to get. And this is a state of the art, the PI, uh, proportional integration controller, uh, 2017, I believe. And it's a long, you know, there are hundreds of paper actually in this community which are um, published on this kind of, uh, hmm? Yes, not RL. This is classical, state-of-the-art control theory, right? And this is a curve you get. It's the best of, best of the art. This is the RL, right? So the RL is near optimal. It's more robust. It generalizes better to different densities of the vehicles, right? It loses a little bit on the left-hand side, but just a tiny, tiny bit, but it's more robust overall. So the hope you can develop more robust RL algorithms. Again, still at the beginning, but as a hope. And you can say, well, you know, um, that was very easy, right? It's one ring, you know, it's easy to do it, right? One lane. Well, let's see what happens in, one, in, in, uh, in multiple lanes, right? Right now, you have two lanes, right? Still a ring. And we have the car, blue car, now it's an autonomous vehicle. So you have one autonomous vehicle, 41 drivers. So what do you think will happen here? What is the solution here? You have one car, yes, very good. <laughs> right? You may say, well, <laughs> you may say this is not natural. Well, it's, it's not true. Look here. This is what happens in real life. When there is an accident and the police wants to slow down the traffic, this is what they do. Okay? So it does happen. Um, now, so far there is no intersection, nothing. So it's a very simple example to have an intersection, and the intersection is a right of way. This is how, uh, what is the rule here, and this is no car is autonomous. And as you can, ima you can imagine, there is a little bit of congestion there where there is an intersection. And now, what do you think is the solution here? You have on one autonomous car, so what is the solution? Hmm? Yeah, so you just think a little bit, and uh, it's, it's a very natural solution. So what do you do? You slow down, you wait for all the trains of car to get through, <laughs> and then you... You see? 
is again all these are all these policies are derived are are RL to learn by is RL, right? So. Yes, but this is what I mentioned. The traditional controllers, they could do it, and actually, but for more complex situations are very complex to develop, and they don't generalize as well. Although in a very particular uh, situation, very constrained, constrained scenarios, they work better, slightly better. Okay, so, um, so here, before we started to work with, with, with this, uh, with this uh, team, we started to work in November. They are using Ara Lab, and uh, Ara Lab, it's, it's a nice framework also developed at Berkeley uh, for reinforcement learning. It's a reinforcement li library, but it, it's using one machine. And the number of nodes you have on the, uh, on, uh, in the first column, the number of CPUs, total number of CPUs across nodes in the second col column, the numbers for Ara Lab and Ara Lib next, and the speed up and the how much it costs. This is on AWS uh, for spot uh, pricing, spot instances. Um, all, in all cases, except in the second row of the numbers, uh, you have per node 16 cores, 16 cores per node. Um, the second uh, row is 72 CPUs. It's just the biggest instance at that point uh, could uh, use on uh, Amazon uh, to one beefy node, so because other lab is running only one node. Okay, so this is RLab. Obviously, you know, you increase the number of CPUs is decreasing. Uh, RLib, it's a little bit better, but the main thing you get with using RLib because it can scale across multiple nodes, right? So obviously, and the scale, it's you know, it, it's reasonable. It's also interesting here that you get also an improvement uh, of uh, a, a, a cost, right? You can get both. both faster and cheaper. These are preliminary results. Uh, so this is another way to look at. Uh, this is uh, for 16, 16 cores per node from one to 128 cores, the speed up on the vertical axis to make it uh, to give you a better sense. It's not 100% speed up. It's a little bit less than 50%. One of the reasons, that's exactly what I mentioned earlier, is that different rollouts can take different amounts of time. Right? There are, these are complex simulations. Right? So they take a different amount of time, then you are going to wait for the slowest. Actually, we can optimize this better, but these are, I got these results only yesterday. So what is the future work? You know, these things are pretty cool. You know, they are fun, and, uh, but they are toy examples. So we want actually, because now we can scale, and one of the main barriers in doing this, for, to apply this to, for more real uh, applications, um, it was a scale, right? But now that we can scale, this is our plan, to go all the way and try to emulate and to simulate first the Bay Bridge, the treasure island, in, you know, uh, and uh, also uh, where you have the toll. That's also something to, to simulate, and then go to San Francisco, right? And then to the next level, we can deploy it, and maybe initially you can deploy it just having like a phone application, and if you have enough and you need to tell people, what is the speed should drive at, and if you have enough people obeying that, maybe you improve the life of everyone. Okay? So that's one application. The second application is quite different. It's SQL query optimization. All of you know here, right? And, you know, lot of research, a lot of papers, right? So actually we pick this example. It's not, I, I think that it's, 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 a, it's a hard problem, right? Because Look, you know, it's, it's, uh, people spend a lot of time to do this, do this optimization, but for us it's like to see how well RL can perform, right? And again, this is again preliminary results. We, we haven't published a paper on this, so it's very preliminary. Um, but despite, despite this work, the, uh, is the query optimization is still hard because, you know, it's like it's highly sensitive, like in accuracy, if you, is cost-based optimization. If you don't uh, accurately estimate the cost, then obviously the optimization will not be good. But the cost estimation is hard because, for instance, it, it may depend on the number of unique countries in your table. You need to know that, right? And that's not easy. But more importantly also, and this 
also it's a more import, important problem today. Um, you do not know um, the, the, the environment when you run. And the, it's the environment, the resource capabilities, uh, availability can change dynamically, right? And this is more and more true today with this uh, new uh, multi-tenancy query engines, BigQuery or Athena from AWS, right? It used to be you have a box, you run the queries, everything is controlled environment. Now it's no longer as, as controlled, right? So that's what it is. And uh, finally, in order to reduce the search space, these optimizers, they have some heuristics, right? Tried and true heuristics. And sometimes they fail, like, like you'll see. Um, it's a very simple query, which tries to figure out what are the items ordered in US by using uh, three, three tables, the order table, the item tables, and the tax table. And you know, the details are not important, but here you have three query plans. The bow tie signifies the joints between two tables. Uh, the sigma is basically a filter. And you have, you can execute different, and these are equivalent. But as you can assume, the cost of executing those, it's also quite different, right? right. So um, that's what, and the query, that's why you have query optimizers, right? Trying to figure out which is a equivalent query plan which has the lowest cost, right? That's the idea, right? Um, how you formulate this as an RL problem? Well, pretty simple. The state is a query plan, okay? An action, it's actually you can do one of these transformations, like predicate push down, reordering the, the joints, right? Which actually maintains the correctness of the previous query. It's equivalent to the previous query plan, but hopefully it's going to improve the performance. So that's an action. The reward is a minus a run in time. You want a low run, uh, low run time, right? So reward typically it's a higher reward is better, right? So you need to put the negative sign. And the policy we use here, a DQN, a simple DQN with two hidden layers. And here are some results, um, some interesting results to give you some intuition what happens and why in some cases you can perform better. So in this case, we have three tables, R, C, and T. R has three columns, A, B, C, and the other tables have two columns, B and D and C and D. And here we have this query, query kind of template, and what we do to learn, we generate 500 queries randomly. So what, how these queries, they keep the same structures, but they are different in group by, instead of B and C, they can be any combination of A, B, and C. And any kind of valid uh, join between RS and RT, right? This is, and then you learn on that. 500 is not, again, it's not a big number. And then, this is what happens. The Postgres plan, we compare it against Postgres, which is pretty mature database. Um, it's again, it's not Oracle, but again, we don't have a yet access to the Oracle query plans. We have to the Postgres query plan. And um, basically there you aggregate after join. You do all the joins and you do this kind of aggregation, the group by you saw uh, earlier on. The learned plan is this, for is a, the second line, um, you see this uh, kind of multiplied, that's a Cartesian product, right? So that's a learned plan. And the performance actually is a learned plan performs much better, 4.7 times better than the Postgres plan. Why is that? It's because I've told you about these heuristics, right? It's current optimizer use heuristics to reduce the cell space. And one of these heuristics avoid Cartesian products. Because in general, they are kind of expensive. So you avoid them, right? So that's the reason. Here is another similar example. This is when you have the UDF, user-defined functions. And the user-defined function, it's again, it's like, it's, they become more and more popular, so it's big data processing, right, you have. 
And, but it's very hard to capture. Many optimizers, they have a lot of difficulty because it's not, they don't have a lot of semantics about that function. Like they know exactly the semantic of the join, of the uh, projection, and so forth, but not of the UDFs. And here it's a very simple example. We just count the number of rows in R which actually uh, meet, you know, the um, filter implemented by the UDF, right? Can be an equality, for instance, with something, you know, TID is equal to 10 or something, or greater than, right? So this is what it's doing, right? And uh, it's again here, the typical, all, every, almost all databases, the typical optimization they do, they push this filter down, right? Okay, why? Because I want to get rid of all the, the, uh, all the rows which I'm not going to process later, right? Why should I process all the rows just later just to filter them out, right? I want to share the load as early as possible so it's filtered, right? The problem here is that now the, the assumption is the filter is very quick, right? It just has some comparison. The problem here is that it's not the case because the filter in this case we are going to put is a UDF is going to be say one second. We put, uh, we put it one second. We just artificially have a latency of one second, okay? Um, so, so it's not a good idea in this case to put the filter, right? And in this case we get an even bigger improvement of 8x and um, the reason is again the cost models often fail to consider UDFs. Here is another result in which you have the number of queries which are executed with the UDFs on the x-axis, on the y-axis you have the runtime, and initially the UDF it's very cheap, the cost almost of zero, so actually the Postgres is doing the right optimization by pushing down the filter, the predicate, uh, but then we change the UDF to become expensive, and in that particular case, Postgres doesn't change the query plan, while um, our system learns to perform better, and then change the query plan and then performs much better. Uh, so it can adapt to dynamic environments, and here it's a TPCH, right, which is pretty standard SQL benchmark, and on the right hand side is better, right? This is how much you perform better in, for each query. There are 22 queries, um, and it's from, you know, all the way to over 200% better. On the left hand side, we perform worse. Um, so it's again, it's again very preliminary results, uh, reasonably good, uh, promising for now. The reason we, when, when there is no dis difference between the Postgres and our learned uh, query plan, these are the simplest queries both of us get correctly. Um, for the one which don't perform as well, it's actually there are more complex queries, right? So there are, uh, nested uh, queries and things like that. Uh, so we still have some work to do there. And many future direction uh, basically uh, improve the generality and um, also hopefully Apache Spark integration. Now let me, I have another eight minutes, so let me go through the last example. So it's control hierarchies. So, as you probably know, one of the biggest challenge for the reinforcement learning application is sample efficiency. How many samples it takes to learn, right? This is one of the big challenges. In the best case, it can take a long time to learn, but in the worst case, it can be extremely expensive and even unsafe when you do these experiments and you learn in a real environment, right? So you want to reduce it. And there are many ways to reduce it, but one way to reduce it is to structure. Why is the search space big? Because you have a lot of states and a lot of action you can take. So one way to reduce it is to structure the spaces, right? If you have a structured space, you reduce the search. And one is to um, use these control hierarchies and to aggregate the low level action in higher level procedures, right? And you really, you can think about this like a program. That's why I'm calling also procedure here. And this is um, the hierarchy for a robot, right? 
And the procedure, by the way, takes the argo, take arguments, and the state of the system here is the entire stack. So for instance, if I am going to grasp an object, here will be the stack. First of all, it's the open ta clear table, that will be the high level task, then clear objects and uh, pick the object and then, no. yeah. Um, so, so this is basically a st as a stack. And this is what you have. And then what you do to teach these robots is to do imitation learning. You tell them, you give them some examples. That's imitation learning. And you try to figure out uh, all these parameters. Um, right? And um, let me just, now, <laughs> there are two ways to, to learn it. One is strong supervision and weak supervision. With a strong supervision uh, means that, um, and this, uh, you know, you, this is again an hierarchy. You have the states and the elementary, the primary actions, and then you have these procedures at the higher level, which consist of primary actions or other procedures, right? So if you know the hierarchy beyond, you know, from the actions up, if you know that, right, it's strong supervision, right? If you do not know, it's weak supervision. Obviously, you prefer to have weak supervision. However, so far, our results are when you have strong supervisions. And I have two examples here. One, it's a, this is, this is, again, it's a toy example. Um, you try to, you know, work before running kind of stuff. And here you just try to learn how to add two integers of, you know, unbounded number of digits, right? And you, with strong supervision, actually, you show the traces of some real algorithms which are doing the addition. And you try to figure out to reproduce that, uh, that's, that, uh, that program, okay? So we are here um, on the, our solution is PHP, it's on the bottom line. So basically, we can expand. We can use much fewer uh, examples to run compared with the previous work, and we have accuracy. We add 100% accuracy even when you have 100 one, numbers of with 1,000 digits to add. Okay, and this is the last video I'm going to show. It's the same thing and the same idea. The control hierarchy applies to robotics. Manipulations, okay. So, so this basically, and you see here, I'm going, I'm showing you the stack on the left hand side. It's a bit slow, you know, we are not going to run the entire video. But you see, now the base of the robot is going to move, uh, is going to go, it's, it's a task here is to set the table, to take these objects, glasses and plates, and to move them on this other table, right? So that was a little bit, it, it saw the object, it was in the right position, it went a little bit back, now it's going to reach to the object, which is a plate, it's going to take the plate, and you can look exactly what is the stack and what action is performing on the left hand side, right? This is not accelerated, this is a real speed, it's uh, 1x. Okay, so it's, that's why it's so slow. When you see many of these things, you see that they are accelerated, so it looks better. Um, so, future work, it's a lot of future work here. Again, we are very big, at the very beginning. Um, imitation, we want to use imitation learning for weak, super, weak, weak supervision, so to figure out actually these hierarchies. Um, and we also looking about here, because all this expensive, takes time, so we want to share the information across robots, so you do this kind of shared learning. And you use what one robot learned, you use for other robots, right, to accelerate the learning and reduce the cost. So in summary, uh, I presented you to, today a, a little bit about what we are doing in the context of RISE Lab with respect to reinforcement learning. This is just, uh, actually, only three projects, there are many more. Um, and the RISE Lab goal, just to remind everyone, what, what we are trying to do is to develop these open source platforms tools 
and algorithms for intelligent real-time decisions on live data, decisions which are secure and explainable. Now, many decisions leverage AI and reinforcement learning. Um, many decisions, you know, like Reza said early on, one of the bottleneck is a scale, scaling these this, uh, this, uh, algorithms. Um, for that, we build Ray and a library on top of that for reinforcement learning. And it's available, do pip install, you can play with it. It's working well even on one machine and it will scale because Python is single-threaded. And um, I also talk, presented some early applications, RL applications, but which I think are kind of promising. And again, we are looking forward to um, improve the results. So thank you, everyone. We have time for a couple of questions. So for questions, could you walk up to the mic? Um, it's kind of hard to run the mic. So there's a, there's a mic here if, for all talks. If you would like to ask questions, um, come up to the mic. And also, uh, please shuffle into the seats. We're, we're probably going to have a packed house, so we'd really appreciate it making it easy for people to get to the seats. Thank you. Um, uh, it seems like Ray is very general purpose. I, I have many uh, MapReduce user ask me, can I do nested uh, jobs? Uh, and uh, how can I deal with state? So is it only for reinforcement learning, or is it uh, the next big thing you know, for anything parallel? I think you are right. It's quite general. Um, it's again, first we are targeting for a particular application, but it's, it's, it's general. Right? If you look at the API, it's, 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 you can, some people think about it like parallel Python. Hi. Uh, my questions are, uh, first of all, how do you choose whether your application is appropriate for this technology? And then in the case of the uh, transportation example, is it your contention that some of this technology could replace existing stoplights and um, uh, uh, other traffic markings with moving vehicles? Yeah, I, I, the second question, can you repeat? Uh, the, I didn't get all, all of it. If you have some of these self-driving cars, running around, do you need less stoplights and less traffic signals, was the second question. A very, very good question. Yeah, so the first question is about, uh, both of them are good and hard. How you pick one of these, uh, pick an application as being a good fit for these uh, um, technologies. And I think that where we are starting from, I mean, is like, you, you go try to go the other way around, um, you try to look at the application first and see what you need in order to solve it. Um, I think that's a better way to look rather than I have the hammer or the nail. Um, so, but you know, to, for, for reinforcement learning, it's typically uh, something which can, it's where you, where you interact with some environment that you can kind of take repeated actions and that will change kind of the environment, right? Um, but, you know, that's kind of the pattern. And it's a very general pattern, right? It's like it's a generalization, actually, of uh, supervised learning, right? So I think that um, this is how, us humans, this is how I achieve the task. We make, we take some actions, try to improve things, you know, everything from preparing a presentation, you always look in the past, what you've done for a presentation was, well, you work better, better this way. So you try to emulate the actions which result in a better outcome, right? So, um, you know, I'll be happy to talk more. It's, it's uh, the, second, the second application, uh, yes, in principle, yes. You can reduce the number of traffic lights, but I think that before doing that, you probably want to somehow to coordinate the traffic light to the flow, right? I didn't follow why the Ray stuff was very RL specific. It could be applied to other. Sorry, I, I didn't understand why that RL. Sorry, that that Ray stuff was very RL specific as opposed to the Ray project. Why was it very RL specific? Uh, yeah. Oh, why why RL specific? I, I didn't see it. I didn't see in the architecture what's the RL specific. Part. I see why they are RL specific. Um, 
I mean, in, in all, as opposed to just using, just using control or? I couldn't quite follow, like, it could be applied to any distributed training scenario or any sort of parallel task yes, framework. Yes, yes. So, so look, I mean, we can go through each of them, right? In, in each of them, actually, you do have this kind of pattern in which you have a state, you take an action, and you can change the state. And you have this kind of concept of reward, which occurs after multiple steps. Like, for instance, in the first case, it's actually, you know, it, it, it actually, you know, in the first stage, it's actually it's a very good, it, it's a very natural thing to try, because RL is, in some sense, a form of optimal control, right? So, so that's the first one. In the case of uh, SQL, it's again, if you think about what I do, I'm going to have a query plan, and then I'm kind of trying to optimize. Again, how I'm going to optimize it? Doing this, taking this, uh, making this transformation to improve the query plan, push down predicates and so forth. Now, you can test after each of them to see how, fa how fast it is, but you know, it could be more expensive. So it's very natural, I do a bunch of transformation. At the end, I test it, oh, was this is better, is faster or not faster? If it's faster, oh, this is a good transformation I made. So I'm remembering them for the, for the, for the future. In robotics, it's practically, uh, you know, reinforcement learning probably it's one of the most successful application areas today. Uh, program synthesis, you know, that's uh, maybe a toy, right? Uh, but yes. Okay. Uh, your approach where you had sort of this branching Workers reminded me a little bit of how the Miss Pacman challenge was solved by distributing it over many agents who then in the end got together and decided together to come to a joint decision. Can you comment a little bit on the relations? Yeah, I think, I think again, they are quite related in, in order, you know, the hierarchy structures are, 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 a, are a way to organize also the, the knowledge and the information. And in some sense, what what the, why the strongest supervised learning is working, strong supervised learning is working in that case, it's exactly because you can capture this kind of human information in this kind of hierarchies. And um, then that will be uh, aid the, um, the, the learning algorithm to reduce the space, right? Yeah, that is a very good question. Thank you.